Hi, I'm Jan, and I want to chat to you today about debt. Is it good or is it bad? Is there a difference? Let's put it this way. If you've borrowed money to buy things and then the things break, they get old, you get bored and you throw them away. You've got no money, you've still got the debt, and you've got no things. If you use borrowed money to buy assets, like a house, shares, gold, bonds, whatever, you've still got the debt, but you've got assets that will increase in value over time, and you can pay out that debt there is a very big difference. Marketing companies, now they spend an enormous amount of money working out how to get us to spend. They spend that money to work out the psychology. Their only job, their one and only job is how to extract money from us. What is going to help them convince us to do that so there's a whole lot of psychology that goes into hey if you don't have this car that handbag those pairs of shoes then you're not going to be happy it's not until you get that product that you will truly be happy and in our instant society and wanting everything right now it works a lot of the time we have tremendously high household debt at the minute. But I want to look more at why that's working. And I believe that that whole notion of being happy by getting external things is false. It's a false one. We know that you can't buy clothes to fill an internal gap. We need to understand why there's an internal gap there the amount of smokes that we smoke, the amount of food that we eat, the amount of alcohol that we drink is not going to fill that empty gap. So it's not so much what the debt is, it's more a question of why we're in debt. And I think nowadays that there's a disconnect with money and it's, um, I think, epidemic. I love, I love Ken Honda who wrote Happy Money, that even in this electronic age where money, you just don't see money. I mean, it's not like the old days where you had $200 in your wallet and they were $10, $20 notes and you've just purchased something. And so there's a whole process then that we've got to go through. We have to open up our wallets. We have to take the money out. We have to have this exchange with an actual person, hand the money over, they put that in the cash register, you get the item and you get a receipt. That whole process involves your vision, involves the kinesthetic of holding money and letting it go. Mm. Involves the hearing as well, cash registers going. We don't have any of that experience now. We tap, we swipe, we zip, we order online, there isn't the same relation, there isn't the same experience with money anymore. And to get back to, to Ken Honda, I love what he says, anytime that you see money going out of your account, you say thank you. Anytime that you see money coming into your account, you say thank you. It's acknowledging there's a flow of money in and a flow of money out. So if we look at money as energy, well, then it's a totally different thing, isn't it? But anyway, I digress. We're getting back to why do we spend more than we earn? Because that's the only way that we can have bad debt. And if you think about it, number one rule in money is it never spend more than you actually earn. 
So why do we spend it? Why do we tap with our credit cards? What have we got available to us to tap? We've got credit cards, we've got Afterpay. Now, even though Afterpay doesn't use debt, it does encourage, and it's a, it's a proven fact, um, Afterpay even have it in their policy with their retailers. I mean, they don't do it out of the kindness of their heart. What they're telling retailers is your client, your customer, your consumer will spend 26% plus more if, they, if you offer Afterpay than if you don't. So even though it's not a debt, it will encourage you to spend more than you possibly intended to in the first place. So there's credit cards, there's Afterpay, there's personal loans from an institution, there are loans from family, and there are the horrible, horrible things like nimble just stay away from them. They are the very worst of the worst. So if we're getting back to why are we spending the money? And I'll share a story with you. When I was self-supporting mum, and if I felt a bit bad, and if I felt sad, and if I felt that the world was just being a bit too tough on me, I would go out and spend. I would buy myself a new pair of shoes or some nice lingerie, to make me feel better. And it absolutely did make me feel better in the short term. But in the long term, um, it wasn't a very good thing to do. And I was what they call an emotional spender. There are two types of spenders, the emotional spender and the competitive spender. Now, a competitive spender is somewhere, a perfect example of this is somebody that's climbing the corporate ladder. So they've gotten a pay rise. And with the pay rise, got to have a better car. And with that better car, they've got to have a better house. So the three better, the two bathrooms and swimming pool is no longer big enough or nice enough or fancy enough. So they upgrade and they upgrade and they upgrade. And it's all about keeping up with the Joneses. So being a competitive spender isn't at all resourceful either. And another example, I have two clients, they were two young women, and one was on a wage, a very, very good wage at that time, which is about 75,000 a year. The other one was on a wage of 25,000 a year. And they came to see me for a couple of different reasons, but the gal that had, there was a gal that had a deposit saved up for a house. Guess which one it was? We assume that if you make more money, it's easier to save, but that's not the case. It's got nothing to do with the amount of money or what you're earning. It's all got to do with how much you're saving. So the young woman that was earning 25000 a year actually was the one that had the deposit for a house. It was very important to her because she grew up with um, not a lot of stability. So for her, her sense of security, her sense of stability was for her to own her own home. And she saved towards that end. She also wanted to build a portfolio of investments. So that's what we were doing with her. The other girl came for a completely different reason. She was a competitive spender and also an emotional spender. So even though she had the higher salary by far, she was actually on the roundabout of the more I earn, the more I spend, the more I need. The more I earn, the more I spend, the more I need. So the work that she needed to do was get off that roundabout stop spending and I'll give you a classic when we worked out the budget when we worked out where her money was going there was an enormous gap and that gap we had eventually identified and this is how we identified it I said okay tell me what goes on in your day what do you do you get up get ready you go to work what do you do then she said well I actually have my appointments very often, most often, in a coffee shop because that's where I feel comfortable, that's where clients feel comfortable 
and we chat over business over a coffee. I went, okay, so who pays for those coffees? And she said, I do. Ah, it's interesting. So how many appointments would you have in a day? Anything between four or five. And how many days of the week would you do, be doing this? Between four or five. When we identified that, we are also identified that she was spending 4% of her net income doing that. So the first change is to change that behavior. So the strategy was then for her to hold the meetings in either their office or in her office. And that became the, the absolute difference in her life. She was able then to start saving, to get off that financial roundabout, to get herself out of debt. Now, if you find yourself in debt, in a lot of financial debt, there are financial counsellors in Australia that you can do, go to, they cost you nothing, they're provided by the government and help you get out of that debt, if it's large. Now, if it's a smaller amount of debt, you can actually handle it yourself by making a commitment, paying those credit cards off as quickly as possible. So let's just say that you've got a $5,000 credit card debt. You can, if you work out your um, where your money is going, you can make a commitment to put away $260 every fortnight and that debt will be paid off within a year. Then what I want you to do is to chop up that credit card. Well, you could, we used to. We used to chop up multiple credit cards, leave one. I have clients that have no credit cards and only use debit cards. And I have clients that use credit cards. Not saying one is right and the other is wrong. It's what you personally would prefer, how you personally would prefer to manage your money. Um, but if you've got more than one credit card, then I'd highly recommend that you consolidate those into one credit card and have an interest-free period, say like 12 months, pay off that debt. Great strategy, but also a very, 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 I'll underpin, very dangerous if you don't have discipline around that. Because then you consolidate all your debts that you've got from three credit cards over here, plonked them onto one, you're going to pay that off at an interest-free rate within 12 months. But the behavior hasn't changed. Underlying belief system haven't been dealt with. So the next thing that happens is that those debts start accumulating again. So you've got this debt over here that you're paying off and you're accumulating more debt. Not a good place to be. So the only way is to become a wise credit card user. And I do have a credit card. I've got a business one and um, a personal one. And I use that wisely. There are all sorts of different um, schemes, loyalty programs and points that you can accumulate. I have actually traveled with my husband, John, um, overseas six times on the frequent flyer points with credit cards. I know they're not as good now as they used to be, but you can be a wise credit card user as long as you use discipline as well. So, let's put that all in a summary. Is there a difference between debt? Is it good and is there bad? Absolutely, there is. And in some circumstances, it's a great way to start building a portfolio, to borrow money, to buy assets. In all cases, whether it's bad or good, you need discipline. But first of all, you also need to understand why if you've got credit card debt, if you've got accumulated bad debt, why you've got that debt. And the only way you can do that is to have a look at the underlying belief systems that are instigating the behaviours. And if you know that you have some unresourceful or sabotaging belief systems around money, then I encourage you to have an RTT session. RTT um, is, is absolutely, I love my training with RTT. It's a combination of different modalities, um, NLP, 
which I do have a master's certification in of hypnotherapy, of psychotherapy, and I am a clinical hypnotherapist as well, um, and CBT. Also, some other strategies and tools that we use that were created by Marissa Peer, who's the founder of RTT, Rapid Transformational Therapy. So you need to explore or change or flip. It, you can choose to do that. But if you want change in your life, especially around your money, well, then you have to be that change.